Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you folks are in for a treat. I think you've been richly rewarded by the fact that you've given up your precious, precious time, including this precious Saturday, to be with us today. But you're about to get a special treat. Uh, you're about to hear from Janet Young. And Janet, uh, her credits are listed in the program, but you've seen her movies. You've seen the films that she's brought, uh, helped to bring uh, to the screen. Going way back, going way back, when she participated in Steven Spielberg's effort to tell a story about a little boy, right? Empire of the Sun. And the little boy has had a career since then, too. Uh, maybe she'll mention that, maybe not. But uh, you've seen him in other things as well. So wartime Shanghai and talking about being in an internment camp in wartime Shanghai, that sort of thing in the film Empire of the Sun. She's made, of course, the tremendous breakthrough film Joy Luck Club, which you know, many of, of us, of course, have read the novel, but the film brought many people who were recognizable in bit roles in various places, but brought them into these starring roles. Really an important film. And then films that you may not associate with her, like uh, The People versus Larry Flint, uh, focusing on First Amendment questions, these kinds of things. She's done all of that. And throughout it all, she's been working on this question of how do I bring the United States and China together? She was educated here in the United States, but went and worked in China for some time and then became this filmmaker. And so she's been involved in efforts to co-produce films, films that involve Americans and Chinese working together to bring something to the screen. And oftentimes, in the stories themselves, having an American and a Chinese component. Perhaps you've seen Shanghai Calling. Uh, if you haven't, I would encourage you to, to do that, but also to see uh, some interviews that she did at USC uh, with us, where she and the other people involved in the film talked about creating that. The screenwriter, director, the star of the film. Uh, it was a special moment when we had a screening of it at, at USC to a packed audience. Uh, they were really, really taken with this. In addition to this work, she's also been one of the most prominent voices, and she'll tell you for too long, one of the few voices talking about bringing Asian stories to the screen and bringing Asians into the film industry. She's been very prominent in this regard. She's a leader at the Asia Society. She's involved in all sorts of activities, including here in the 1990 Institute, where she's a longtime friend of the program. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear about contemporary China's cinema, about things going between the two countries from Janet Young. Let's welcome her. Clay is the best. He has done so much through his organization down at USC. Thank you very much for having me today here. I just got in in the nick of time. <laughs> you got to have a break. But I did want to talk about something that is very, very near and dear to me and also could be very helpful to you. Because as we know, we're living in a very visual society these days. Kids don't like to read as much as they like to look at pictures. Is that your experience? That's my experience. I have a son. So um, ironically, I came into this whole sort of journey of my life through cinema in China. I grew up in this country, had very little awareness of my parents' background. My father's from Shanghai, mother's from Hunan, really grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, really didn't know the first thing about China, sadly. But in 1972, we had a chance to visit China, and it opened up my eyes, and I decided, oh, I better learn Chinese, because I am Chinese. And so I just went to, into a deep dive in college and decided I had to now go live in China, which is what I did in the early 80s, working at the Waiwenju, at the Foreign Languages Press. And it was while I was there that I had an epiphany, 
which was that growing up in this country, I never got to experience Chinese on screen. And therefore, I thought we were barred from the screen. I didn't know that we could be involved in making movies or being in movies or telling stories. We were, in my mind, supposed to just be beavering away with our math and science homework. And I decided I needed to change that. And I wanted mostly for people to see Chinese on screen in a three-dimensional light because that was who we were, more than the very, very slight roles that we had in film and television in America, which was, of course, the dominant industry. So my first mission was to bring Chinese films out. And I, I saw some wonderful films. It was a, a flourishing period in the 80s with artists and writers and, and filmmakers. And uh, you, the now famous Chiang Kai-go was making films. His very famous DP, Zhang Yimou, was making films. And so I started bringing these films out with really the intention that perhaps we, Chinese, would be seen differently if people saw these films. Then I had this rare opportunity to represent the studios to sell Americans, American films to China, Americans in the process, yes. Um, and then I ended up working with Steven Spielberg, as Clay mentioned, on the movie Empire of the Sun. And that's when I had my other epiphany is that if we are able to make decisions about what to put on screen, as producers do, that could change everything. Because what I thought was the kind of impossible barrier to cross was now suddenly seeming more than possible. It's like, yes, we write things, we write characters, we put them on screen, et cetera, et cetera. And I had, so I had this incredible fascination both with Chinese cinema and how to get more Chinese on screen in the West. And that really dictated a lot of my decisions. But let's focus today on Chinese cinema because uh, the movie, Chen Gai Ge's first movie is called Huang Tu Di, Yellow Earth, probably was the inspiration for me to, to realize there was so much artistry and so much talent in China that I felt really needed to be explored. So, oh, how do I do this? Where's my thing? Huh? <laughs> ah, got it, sorry. I'm a little technologically uh, challenged. Um, so, the, a lot of people are talking about the Chinese film market today. Back in the 80s, there was one film organization, a giant film organization that did all the producing, distributing, financing, exhibiting of all films. And it was all very, very state controlled. Over the decades, that has really changed a lot. And, and nobody was paying to back. Again, when I was starting out, and this is one of the miracles of life, it, China, and particularly Chinese cinema, was a speck. It was, it was a speck. Nobody was paying attention. People thought I was crazy, even my own parents. They're like, why are you doing this? There's no obvious you know, growth in this area. But obviously, that has changed. So the 80s was a period where some good films were getting made, just getting some attention, going to festivals. The 90s was actually a flourishing period. A lot of films that you probably know about, Zhang Yimou's films, like Red Sorghum and Raise the Red Lantern, and all those red films. No, I'm joking. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, beautiful films that uh, would go to festivals and get very, very critically lauded. But they didn't really reflect China at the time. They were often films that were set in the past. And I think people started not appreciating that aspect of the films, beautifully made, but did not really write. If you wanted to learn about China, you did not watch those films and think, oh, this is exactly what China is today. That started changing. You know, the, the market started growing. And uh, so, uh, this is just an example. A, a, there was a big turning point in China in 2012. The, at the end of 2012, there's a movie called Taijung, Lost in Thailand, that uh, was uh, Xu Zhong made, a very famous actor, director. And that film was made for probably less than 10, I don't know the exact budget, but it was a very, very low budget film and, cr and made over $100 million. And that was the first time that, you know, Hollywood sometimes needs these kind of benchmarks and they want $100 million. $100 million sounds really good. And uh, they, s people started taking notice, you know, like, wow, they're making films. And then there were a succession of films after that, uh, one called um, um, The Mermaid, and one called Pancake Man, Jian Xia, and uh, various other films that were crossing the $100 million dollar mark again and again. And again, this really took note, people started taking notice. In the meantime, in the US, just by comparison, the growth has really been much slower. It's some years it plateaus, some years it dips, some years it goes up, but it's not moving at the same rate. I mean, the Chinese box office has just been on the upsurge. Um, these are the actual numbers. And then when the Chinese overall box office crossed a billion dollars, that's when Americans started really thinking, we better get a piece of that. Uh, how, how do we do that? So you can just see this incredible growth. 
most of the films, um, oh, here's a number of films, quite a few. Not all of them do well, of course, but this is, you know, this is how they started building screens like crazy. I mean, literally multiple screens every day, every day, every day. And there, while the per screen average in China now is still lower than the U.S. is, it's starting to get closer and closer and closer. So, you know, you have to fill those screens with something, right? What have they been filling them with? Oh, this is another. Um, th there's always a lot of tension. Since Hollywood has dominated the market for, for since its inception, really, over 100 years ago, there's always a, a, some tension about, well, do we let all the films in or do we not? China has always imposed a quota. And uh, that quota was jumped from about uh, 14 to 34 in in, in several years ago when Xi Jinping visited the States and they worked out a deal and so it's been holding steady at that. However, it's really good to know that this quota is really refers only to revenue share and, and box office. You know, th there's many other films that get into China that are just on the, what they call the Mai Duan system or they're just the buyouts or they have a special bonus system. So this quota really refers only to the top, top, top movies where the studios want to see major upside and they get a percentage of the box office. I don't want to, I really want to get into the content, so I'm going to race through this. So uh, this is a picture from, I think, the uh, Feng Xiaogang movie, Feng Hua, right? Um, or what, yes. So the, the, for me, what, what is really interesting, because whether I'm in America or China, I'm not the biggest fan of superhero movies or big action fantasy movies or whatever. They're okay. They're okay. But what I really like are movies that tell good and real stories, you know, whether or not they're fictionalized or not. I like films about real people. This has always been my passion. And so I find it interesting that you can see, for sure, action films still dominate. Comedies, uh, there are years where they really dominate. Fantasy, whatever. Drama is not a, you know, uh, is up there. However, however, I have to say, I really do believe this is starting to change. I mean, I've, I've been kind of waiting. I really haven't made a film in China in recent years because I really didn't think I was in sync with the tastes there. They're, they're very, you know, again, very fantasy oriented, very, very sort of, they're a little bit hunao. They're like kind of messy and, you know, all over the place. It's just not my thing. So I haven't chosen to do that. But I see some very encouraging signs. And when I think back on films over the last decade, I can think of many films, actually, that really do represent real issues that are going on in China today. And that's what I want to focus on. So what else do I have here? OK, so I just wanted to show you a comparison. So in, in, in 2017, these are the top box office films. Again, comedy, action, comedy, romance, fantasy. There's one drama, <laughs> action, romance, romance. And that hasn't changed that much. I just had to do a comparison with 2012. Is that did it say 2012? It should say 2012. And it's, oh no, this is 2018, Wolf Warrior. Oh, that's 2017, sorry. I think the other one was 2012. Oh, this is 2012, and that, the, this is 2017. So again, sim the genres haven't changed that much, but I mean, the, the genres have not changed that much. But there's, you know, usually a drama ekes in. In 2018, we don't have the f all the figures yet. There is a film that is going to for sure pop. It has made close to $500 million, and the movie is called Dying to Survive, and I'm going to talk about that. But first, I'm going to go back in time a little bit and talk about other films that I've seen over the years that were very, very touching and very much reflect. I would highly recommend them to you to recommend to your students because they're well-made films that show a lot of real life issues in the Chinese society. I happened to see this at the Shanghai Film Festival several years ago, and I was so touched. The, um, the filmmaker discussed how this was actually inspired by a true story. When he was in college, he, there was a, a student, a fellow student who came from the countryside. And that, uh, that, that peasant, that countryside student, did everything he could to try to fit in. He was like very taoha, like he was always trying to make food or get tea or please other people who obviously felt a little out of place and insecure. And he just never felt like he fit in. He ended up sort of getting, uh, befriending this woman in town who worked at a salon. And they have a relationship and it was, it's a lot about his internal conflict and it ends very tragically with a suicide. 
And apparently, for the filmmaker, John Gary, he said, you know, I just, when I heard that he committed suicide, he felt so guilty. This film was made kind of in commemoration of him because he said, we didn't do enough to make him feel comfortable. And I think it's just so, it was very, very, very touching. And so I um, recommend this because it, it sh I think it shows very authentically university culture and then what it was like for this student to be there and then how he drifted to kind of the towny, uh, you know, environment because he was so, he felt so out of place in university and how, how, how his decline happened. So that one was actually from all the films that I'm going to talk about now are really from the last, this is the oldest one, it's from 2010. So I really want to talk about the contemporary, more contemporary films. But this was a personal favorite of mine. Um, this film came out just a few years ago. It was uh, Feng Xiaogang's film, I Am Not Madame Bovary. Um, and it is a very interesting story. It's a little bit reminiscent of Zhang Yimou's earlier films in that is a female protagonist. and. Uh, the phenomenon that kicks off the whole story is one that you've probably heard about where because of the restrictions to buying real estate property in China li being limited to certain individuals, a lot of couples were getting divorced so they could each buy property. And then the idea is they'd get divorced and then they'd come back together again. Well, in the case of Peng Jinglian, they get divorced with the understanding that they would then actually, it was all, you know, just a, 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 a ruse to, to get more property, but then he's like, no, I'm not marrying you again, and he has an affair, and, and then he tries to turn the whole situation against her and accuses her of having an affair, and it just goes on from there, and it's about her battling for her rights and for, for justice and trying to explain. It gets more and more absurd as the story goes on, and she's like, wait, don't you understand we, what happened? I thought we were, I thought we were just doing this so we could get more property. Right, and it's a really well done film. Um, I, I really quite like it. Um, so I think that's a, a very, it's, it's a lot of the shaming and it's a lot of this, that, but it's just, it shows how these unusual circumstances in China, and we, there's so many changes all the time, can, you know, how it affects interpersonal relationships. Um, this is another amazing film that I saw a, a female filmmaker named Vivian Chu. And she very, very, you know, people have asked me over the years, over the years, how long it's only been, maybe a year, um, about the Me Too movement. Will this hit China? And many people have said, no way. Well, no, China, no, people don't speak up in China. Well, we know now that that's not the case. There's been recent situations of, of high profile individuals who have been called out. This film is, is quite a good film. It's set, um, in a motel and uh, sh this young woman, it's through her eyes, she witnesses something that s unsavory that goes on between an older man and two young women. And again, I don't think this is, I, I've met this filmmaker, I don't think it's actually based on a true story per se, but it's two incidents very, very similar to this. And I just think these, are, these films are so bold. I mean, all of you know that China has, you know, its restrictions, and you're always trying to kind of navigate through the cracks and figure out, and, and pushing the envelope and seeing how far you can go. But I really do feel that if you kind of do a, you know, scratch beneath the surface, there's so much that is almost shockingly revealed, and and this idea that oh, there's, you know, it, it is not North Korea. <laughs> oh, well, sorry, it is. Um, just hold this. It is the, the so-called restrictions. My personal feeling is that the government is, is more scared of the people than the people are of the government, and they have to pretend that they've got it covered. You know, they, they have to remind people, we're the boss, this is what we're doing, and they make examples of people. And unfortunately, Western press tends to really focus on uh, what the government is, is, you know, at the moment saying it's in the, how they're cracking down or doing this or doing that. And what unfortunately gets lost, I think, in the conversation is all the things that are happening. You know, the, the idea that uh, at one time recently the government decided they, there were, could be no homosexual content on streaming. And then there was such, uh, apparently 300 million people in China, I forgot the actual hashtag, there was a hashtag, it was called I am, I am gay or something like that, hashtag I am gay. 300 million people, not to say that everybody really was, but they were supporting the movement, and the government instantly reversed its course. 
Now that is people power. That's the kind of people power that we don't often see here. So the government officials really do look closely at what's happening on social media, and they're very, very intrigued, you know, they, they have to, add for survival, they have to respond to what's going on. So that's just an example. And I think, um, by the same token, I think the so-called Me Too movement is definitely taking hold in China, and it's having an effect. So I feel that films like this really also have, have repercussions. The, okay, now I'm confused. Where's, oh, here. <laughs> Got too many gadgets going on. Um, so this is the movie that um, makes me very happy also. It came out uh, just earlier this year. Again, it made, oh, it's, it's creeping up there. It's still climbing. It's still in theaters. It's, f I think, right now, like 450 million. Do you know how much money that is? <laughs> it's a lot of money. I mean, people in this country would, like, drool for that kind of box office for what is essentially a drama. I mean, dramas don't make, you know, they did not spend $150 million to make this movie. This movie is, uh, is about a kind of, a sort of a scrappy, I'm sorry, this mic is, uh, a scrappy ne'er-do-well guy who's running this, uh, Yao Dian, who's running a, 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 a shop to sell medicine. And it turns out that um, he's been bringing in uh, a, a knockoff of a leukemia medicine from India. Uh, and then it's exposed that this is a knock, it's working, it's, it's very effective, but it's not the actual brand that is well known and it's not nearly as expensive, so people can afford it. Well, he gets, unfortunately, shut down, and people start dying because they can't get the medicine. So anyway, it goes through many, many convolutions after that, um, but the result is that the government has also taken action. They realize this is a problem. People have been seeing this movie with just incredible interest, and, and you know, they uh, have, again, had a direct effect, so I believe that movies like this, these are four that I just wanted to focus on now because I'm sort of unclear how much time I have because I was late and blah, blah, blah. But, um, but I, I, and there's many others I could discuss. Um, but what I find very encouraging as the box office grows, it looks like, you know, they're, they're, you may or may not know that the movie industry has gone through some changes recently. They removed the other, the former head of the film bureau, his name is Zhang Hongsen, and they put him in the TV department, and they put in somebody else na named Wang Xiaohui, and people really don't know much about this person except that he's more of a bureaucrat, thank you, um, then he's a film person, Zhang Hongsen was a film person, so there's a lot of caution and a lot of concern right now, but at the same time, right underneath the surface again, and this is always the paradox of China, you think it's going in one direction, and partially because of the delay reaction of films taking so long to make, the films that we're seeing coming out now are actually extraordinary. This is going to be a banner year for Chinese cinema. I'm involved in something called the US-China Entertainment Summit, and we work closely with UCLA um, China On Screen Biennial, which is a, something you may all be interested in. It happens at the end of October and beginning of November. And I was just talking to the curator of that festival, Chung Sim Lim, she just got back from China. She said she's seen some extraordinary films, both narrative films and documentaries. Ten more minutes? Oh, okay. Do, do I leave some time for Q&A? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so she's seen some extraordinary films that are, again, along these lines, very reflective of Chinese society, smaller, there's also a big movement now to promote independent films, so there's many, many, many first-time filmmakers. A lot of the big companies are realizing, you know, we can't, we can't just go on making the same old, same old films, we really have to bring new voices into the mix. You know, now they've got all these screens to fill, like we really have to make good films. So there's a, a huge explosion of independent cinema, so it's, it's like, the wheels are turning in so many different directions. On the one hand, it does look like there's more restriction we're, we're hearing, but on the other hand, again, these independent, there's a, Jia Zhang Ke is another well-known filmmaker you've probably heard of, and he has, there's a whole independent film festival that's going on. Many of the big theater chains, including Wan Da and others, they are creating so-called art houses. So this, to me, is um, very exciting. You know, As I said, I, the last several years with the films that they've been showing, I haven't really wanted to put my name on a movie like The Mermaid. It just was not my kind of thing. 
Um, if you've seen it, it, you know, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a little bit hunao, like it's a, it's a very, very Hong Kong influenced and um, so they're kind of big and messy. I, again, I like to tell authentic stories where possible. And now I finally feel like there's the beginning. We'll see where it goes. One never wants to put the cart before the horse when it comes to China. I have no idea, really. I, I don't know if this trend will continue. I believe it will because I believe the people are demanding it. I believe the audiences, and we've seen these cycles in many other countries. The audiences become more and more sophisticated. They're less enamored of the American superhero movies, and they're looking for th stories that really that there's expressions, you know, that really resonate with them, that are really about what's going on in China. So that is um, what I want to tell you about. I, so I, I highly encourage all of you to, um, on a separate uh, document, I have ma given you links to about 20, 30 films that all reflect, again, contemporary issues over the years. So I really encourage you to, all of them I think are really worthy. I, I picked through them very carefully. I, all of them I think are very worthy and for you, your important job teaching, teaching people about China, I think film is, has become just an excellent way to do that. Um, let me open up for questions and answers. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, I'm, I'll inch over this direction. I'll give you mine if. You'd be. Um, thank you so much. Um, so you mentioned Me Too movement, and you also mentioned uh, sort of censorship and some of the, or I don't know if you use the word censorship, but some of the barriers um, that uh, can happen in China. And um, so one thing I noticed was with the Me Too movement, um, the actual words Me Too were sort of censored in China before. But then people started using the icon of a rice bowl and a rabbit, because in Chinese, Ooh, me, yes. too. me too. Yeah. Me means rice, and tu means rabbit. So they were really creative in how they got around that censorship. So I'm curious if you have other examples of people using creative ways in cinema to express things that perhaps the government wants to block or doesn't want to encourage. Um, I think with that environment, there's probably more creativity in how the subtlety of these messages and how they're conveyed. And I'm curious if there are other examples of that. That's a good question. I'm not sure I can think of anything because cinema can be so literal and it's so public and it's so literal. And people, they, you know, that is the good news and bad news is that people can read it in a, in a very, very specific way. So I think you have to be extra careful. You know, that something like Me Too, which is so obvious and it's wonderful. I hadn't actually heard that, but I've heard of many other examples of memes or other word games, and the Chinese are so clever at that. Um, but I, I think that with cinema, it's, it can, you know, I did feel this a lot earlier on in the 80s and 90s when people were just testing the waters in a way, and they were making films that were subtle commentaries. But I guess what I'm saying is that it's not subtle anymore. <laughs> they're just putting it right out there. I mean, it is very, dying to survive, it is very obvious what they're saying. They're saying people are dying because they can't afford this medication. And that's what I guess is so, what I find so wonderfully bold about what's happening in cinema. So not so subtle, I would say, if anything. Hi. Uh, Hi. This is on? Okay. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, in North America, especially in the Bay Area, I start seeing like the major house like AMC, the commercial, they start carrying uh, Chinese movie ro more regularly. And I, I've been to a couple of them. And then uh, two kind of observations. One is I noticed that there's so many production company for one film. Like with the domestic film, I could have seeing like five or six different, like kind of beginning of the, the movie, there's like productions company, and I wonder, is it just a Which ones are you referring to? Do you know? Uh, You're talking about Chinese films? Yeah, Chinese the films. Chinese, uh, the, so this, the, the environment is, the industry is dominated, just like it is here, by several, you know, Huayi Brothers, yeah. Wan Da, uh, yeah. Wan Na. These are the ma several of the major companies, mm -hmm. Zhong Ying and, yeah. you know, and like Guangxi. So, you'll, yes, you'll see those credits a lot because but there's many, many credits. In China, yeah. is that what you're saying? Is yeah, that like there there's yeah. not just two major, like yes. there's five well, small ones. That yes, I've because a lot of Chinese of. like to co-invest. They don't want to take full responsibility. They're like, I think I want to do this, but I feel better if you invest it too. 
So they're often law, you know, they're always lock Wednesday. They're always bringing, pe they're bringing peop other people into the mix. So I wonder, yeah. is this just for the economic side of it, or there's political side of this? Because uh, have their I think it's mostly economic. economics. Uh, there might be some political. It really is just about hedging your bets. Okay. You know, primarily economically. Well, you you need a distributor, so you have to have one big company who's doing the distribution. But actually, there's been, and I, it, I've this the tide is stemming a bit. But the last several years, we've seen this huge rush mm -hmm. of companies and individuals who want to invest in cinema. I've been told partially because the stock market isn't doing so well in some cases or the real estate market isn't doing so well. This looked like, because of that period from th that I was mentioning from Taidung, from 2013, 2014, 2015, it looked like China was just a blockbuster making you know, country. So everyone, they just rushed in that direction and now they're being, uh, many people are getting burned because there wasn't enough discretion, in my opinion, and they'd say, here's a script and here's some actors and director, let's, you know, it's bound to make money and that is never the case. So they've had to learn the hard way. But I think because so many people wanted to get in, and each, you know, at Buona, for instance, I know them pretty well, they, they were able to raise a s several funds in the hundreds of millions of dollars without any difficulty. They just said, we're raising a fund, and everybody's rushed in. Not all of them are so happy anymore, but they, they were able to do it because people were dying, dying to get into film business and dying to survive. No, dying, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and my second question yeah. is how, how those movie got picked to show on those uh, theater here, because I see I, I see youth, uh, right. I see the the journey to the west, but a lot of them right. uh, I didn't get to see. Uh huh. Well, um, first of all, it's a miracle that any Chinese film gets seen here, because <laughs> in general, Western audiences, American audiences, don't watch subtitled films. There are very 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 few films, but I think the there's a couple of uh, there's a, a company called China Line Washer that, that uh, represents Bona and Huai Brothers. And so those films, you know, and, and Feng Xiaogang is part of Huai Brothers. So, so some of those films that they're in particular focusing on those, which tend to be the best ones. Of course, they're just like the f American films going to China, they're gonna focus on the ones that are most successful and that people in China uh, or people from China, the diaspora here are most, most likely to hear about. So they're like, oh, I wanna see. So there might be more obscure films that aren't there. But that's why we like these festivals. That's why you know organizations like Clay's, and that's why we do our U.S. China Film Summit and and the On Screen Biennial. So there's a l you know we try to bring more independent films that would be m perhaps more appealing to a group like this. But you're you're not in the majority. I hate to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in the blue shirt. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I saw on the graph the animated films are going down. Um, can you just talk about how children are a targeted audience for the films? And are Chinese families using it as a teachable moment to show film or even a family outing to go watch, watch movies? Right, that's a good question. I personally feel that in general, the world over, the family film market is underserved. People, parents, and, and that's true in China as well. I think parents are dying to have something to take to their, you know, their children to. Um, I think animation is somewhat flourishing. I happen to be involved with an animated film right now that is uh, with the former DreamWorks Animation Studio, now called Pearl Studios, and Netflix. And it's, it's based on an original story of mine uh, that's inspired by Chang'e, the moon goddess. And, I s you know, and it's going to be a musical, and it's, uh, it's coming out in 2020, just to plug it. But um, I think the there I you know I, I parents seem to really want it. I don't know if that graph shows that that's an overall trend. It just so happens that it dipped. There's been a number of animated films that the Chinese have made that there are a few that have done very well. And there there was a time where the government said we want, we should have more animation companies, and suddenly literally there were hundreds of thousands of animation companies, and most of them were not really producing anything of quality. So while there's a lot of attempts. At animation, there are very, very few that actually are distributed and do well at the box office. But again, I think that's just a question of time. I think there's a lot of potential. I think a lot of, you know, especially when it comes to things like visual effects and animation, I think there was just a, there's been a lack of understanding about how much skill <laughs> goes into it. So people thought, we'll get the equipment, and then we'll, you know, we'll get the post-production equipment, we'll get the animation equipment, we'll do this, and then they, there was a rush to do things, and they haven't, there's several high-profile cases, like um, um, Guo Jingming, who made a very uh, interesting, made several very, very popular films, 
um, tried to make a big sci-fi movie, and it like completely tanked. And then there's the example, I hate to say it because I'm very fond of the company or the head of the company, Alibaba, but you know they invested over $100 million in this recent film called Asura. And they pulled it after three days because it only made seven million within three days. And that's like disastrous. I mean, it's just, so there's often this feeling that, oh, we have to compete with Hollywood. We have to make the films that they're making. We've spent a lot of money and we'll get, you know, great visual effects and, and you know, and, but it's, it is so much more that goes into it. And I think that's been an unfortunate, you know, trend is this kind of imitation. I think that's partially related to the quota system. There's only so many films that can get in from America, as I was saying before, that they think those are the, that, that becomes the, what they mimic. And what I like seeing is that there are more and more domestic films that are not, again, mimicking Western films, but are really telling true Chinese stories. Yes? Um, do they have a rating system like we have? They, yeah, it's a really good question. They do yeah. not, and that's one of the points of tension because they're, that's why the censorship tends to be even stronger than it would otherwise. Because if you're thinking about a film being for everybody, then of course you have to draw the boundaries a little bit differently. So there's been a lot of talk about having a rating system, but so far they do not have a rating system. Yes. I might be going over time. Just cut me off Wait. whenever. La last Hi, this question. is a question about the movie business uh, in China. I was uh, last night at the Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise's first you know, recent you like film. It? The fir I loved it, but the first thing I saw on the screen was Alibaba, the producer. Yeah. Yes, Alibaba and many, so uh, in the last several years, many major investors from China have been investing in, in companies, in slates of films, like Hunan Weishi, Hunan Satellite, invest in Lionsgate movies, and uh, Bona has invested in Fox movies, and Alibaba has invested in Paramount movies. So they're making deals. And I was wondering whether that's also for the Chinese consumption because I get the, the top. The other thing w was uh, there was a preview of Mark Wahlberg uh, on a, a Chinese joint production of a movie that's coming out. It seems like he's now a big star in China. Many, many of the big stars here, uh, so you asked two questions, I'll address them separately. Uh, many American stars are big in China because their movies have played there. So yes, there was a, there's a whole uh, movie made with a bunch of stars like Bruce Willis and blah, blah, blah. It didn't do well, but again, there's this, there's this whole flirtation going on. Everybody wants the other. The Chinese, if you're a big company in China, you want also a piece of what might be the first or second largest market. It doesn't matter whether America's number one or China's number one, or they're number one and number two, no matter what, right? So if you're a big American company, why wouldn't you want a piece of the Chinese market? If you're a Chinese company, why wouldn't you want a piece of the American market? So there's a lot of flirtation and courtship and experiments and bad dates and good dates and, <laughs> you know, swiping on Tinder. No. It's like just, but people are trying a lot of things. So one of the problems perhaps, or one of the issues, one of the sort of qu quick fixes that people are trying to do is like, let's put a, let's put a, if it's a Chinese movie, let's put a Western movie star in it, and then that's bound to, or vice versa, American movies, let's put a Chinese star. It doesn't usually work that way. There's many examples of where it didn't work. Like with uh, Spider-Man, they put, was it Li Bingbing or Fan Bingbing? I can't remember. But they, and, then, and the Chinese audience's response, like, why did they even bother? She didn't really have a role. Like, they should have just, you know. So sometimes the attempts are very obvious, um, but you can't blame people for trying. You know, I think what the, the hard work is going to come when people come up with real stories that, that people like and that naturally, organically, have Western and Eastern cast. So I think my time is up. No, uh, oh. first, thank you. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Two quick observations. One, you've got Janet Young's playlist. <laughs> this is an incredible resource. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is somebody who consumes all these things, knows how they came into being, and all of that sort of thing, and has given you recommendations on things. You're, you're not going to be able to show a full movie, probably, but you could show clips, and you could encourage your students on their own to seek these things out. And the point here is that these are contemporary films and, and addressing the issues that Janet has already highlighted. I, I want you to test their long-term memory here. 
Uh, by going ahead, even though the film's not gonna be out for two more years, huh. tell us a little bit more oh. about this very important Chinese story. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, it's tied to the Chinese space. I mean, the film isn't, but the, 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 the story itself winds up inspiring the names for the rockets and for the space missions and all that sort of thing, please. I will do that. And the, uh, I, first I wanna mention, there's a caveat to the links they should, first of all, some of them may be illegal. I can't guarantee they're, one, I, I was shocked, <coughs> my assistants were helping me do this. I was shocked because one of them came off a porn site, but then I was like, it's gotta be somewhere else, and they did, they changed it, so you won't be caught going on a porn site. That was really weird. But it was like the whole movie was there in beautiful form on a porn site. <laughs> but um, the links, it may or may not be, you know, I, I don't know, how, it's really hard. To, I keep asking and they're like, well, we don't know if they're legal or not. It's, it's hard to know. Okay, that's a, my disclaimer. Okay, so the movie that you'll hopefully want to see in 2020 is called Over the Moon. And I was asked to be part of this brain trust with DreamWorks, and with then DreamWorks Animation several years ago and to come up with potential story ideas. So I kept thinking Chang'e, you know, it's a story that we're very familiar with. It's like, you have Chang'e, you have a rabbit, you have mooncakes. This is like, there's gotta be something there. But I wanted to tell a story about female empowerment and I wanted to make a contemporary story because I feel like if it's a moon goddess in robes, like who cares, right? So the story is actually about a girl from a mooncake making family who wants to go to the moon. She builds her own rocket ship and goes to the moon to meet Chang'e. And uh, I actually, just a couple of days ago, saw the first quote unquote screening, a screening of an animated film. This is my first animated film, so I'm learning as we go along. Um, but a screening of an animated film just means that it's storyboards that are, that are filmed. It's not, the animation hasn't actually even started yet. It's just a bunch of drawings. The director is a fabulous, uh, legendary uh, animator who created The Little Mermaid. His name is Glenn Keane, so that's gonna be uh, there will be a theatrical release in this country, and then it will be on Netflix. So, yes, thank you for letting me plug that. <laughs> okay. And one more question, because you talked about you know, family friendly and reaching all these things. One of the things, of course, that's happening is now, you know, you're used to the big screen, producing yeah. for that big screen. And our students at USC, some of them are now producing for six inch screens and they then go to work for Tencent and these other companies making these sorts of things. Uh, short videos for a, smaller, for a smaller screen. And I would like you to say just 30 seconds on the question of storytelling and the pipeline of talent and you know, the venues that they now have. All in 30 so seconds. Of only 30 seconds. Thanks so much, Clay. You're so generous. Um, I'll talk very fast. The, the it's storytelling is changing. It's inevitably changing. People do it on the fly. Everything's getting shorter. I, I, we lament, those of us who grew up in the movie business, we do lament some of this at the same time. We're so excited by so many things coming out on Netflix and Amazon because they basically scooped up all the great writers. The studios stopped making interesting movies, in my opinion. They're making $150 million, again, superhero movies, and they're not interested in anything else. So there's all this talent that was for a while lying around with nothing to do, and Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all of that, those streaming sites have been scooping that up. The same trend is happening in China, though they're a little behind. So for the time being, the box office is still robust, but there, these street, you know, the the uh, ITE, which is uh, owned by uh, Baidu, and uh, Tencent is very, very strong, and Yoku Tudo, those are the main streaming sites in China. That that Yoku Tudo is owned by Alibaba. They are also very aggressively making content. So basically, we're going, we're entering a world where there's exponentially more content available to us. So people really will not be going to the movie theaters very much. And this is so, I personally feel overwhelmed all the time. I have friends who have making this or that and I can't, don't even get to see it, you know. That is the world we're facing and everyone's just gonna have to scramble, and including me. <laughs> and it's a great thing to have an embarrassment of riches, uh, you know, coming up. Ladies and gentlemen, this hasn't been a perfect <laughs>